begin with a few words about the terrible helicopter crash that claimed the lives of six Armed Forces members last week. Yesterday, I attended a ceremony in their honour. I was grateful to have an opportunity to pay my respects. I got to speak with mothers, fathers and stepfathers, grandparents, friends, sons and daughters, fiancés, partners and loved ones. All of them were heartbroken, but all of them were also immensely proud of the life of service chosen by their loved one, as are we all. We will never forget their service. They will live on in our hearts, and I know the thoughts of all Canadians are with the families and loved ones uh, who were going through an incredibly difficult time. We stand with them, and we will continue to stand with them. As time and time again, members of the Canadian Armed Forces step up to help those in need. Whether it be as a part of a NATO mission in Europe or in the wake of a natural disaster here in Canada, they're always there for us, eager to help, ready to serve. And this pandemic is no exception. When our government received requests for assistance from Ontario and Quebec, our men and women in uniform once again answered the call. In Ontario, 265 CAF members have now been deployed to five long-term care facilities. They are supporting our frontline workers, caring for our parents and grandparents, and bringing some comfort to their families. If you've lost a loved one in, the, in one of those facilities, or if you have a loved one you haven't been able to visit for weeks, you're worried sick about what tomorrow will bring and you hope that they're getting the care they deserve. Seeing our CAF members offer their help and talents during these uncertain times is a reassuring sight for many of these families. So I want to thank all of those who've been deployed and all the frontline workers who continue to work harder than ever to keep our seniors safe. And it should be on the only military in the country, you know, 1,200 Canadian Rangers were deployed in order to limit the propagation of the virus in many areas, including 200 Rangers in Nunavik and in Basque Nord. And across Quebec, we count now over 670 members of the Canadian Armed Forces in 20 long term healthcare centers for our elderly on top of additional support staff and we are planning that a total of uh, 1350 military troops will be affected to this operation to support up to 25 establishments the chslds and the elderly residences are the most hard hit to the places by covid 19 and our members are there to help out and they are now taking care of our parents our grandparents and they are supporting uh, the staff and nurses and frontline workers uh, who are making working long hours and for weeks in tougher and tougher conditions. I want to take time right now to thank all our military troops that are helping out in these days. And I also want to acknowledge the incredible job that our frontline workers are doing since the beginning of this crisis in the CHSLDs and elsewhere. You are a source of motivation for all of us. You are taking care of our parents and you are taking care of our the people who are ill in our society and you're taking care of us and you're leading the fight against COVID-19 since the beginning of the crisis and you should have more than just our recognition. You should be paid conveniently for the essential work that you are doing. Today, I'm able to announce that we have concluded a deal with all the provinces and territories in order to bona fide the salaries and wages of essential workers. We're currently working on details with the last provinces, but I want to underline that this is a joint effort. All the premiers agreed we must support our essential workers. I want to thank them for first tackling the issue in a, a team spirit. And we are counting on those workers now more than ever, and we will be there for them. It's the government of provinces and territories that will determine precisely who will get a, a wage hike 
And this is what we need to remember. If you're risking your health to allow us to go through this crisis and that you're paid at a minimum wage, you should have more. Today I can announce that we have an agreement with all the provinces and territories to provide a wage top-up for essential workers, for Canadians who are being called to work, to go to work every day, for Canadians who are providing us with essential services so we can continue to keep our families safe and healthy. Right now, we're finalizing the details with the last provinces, and I want to underscore that this has been a truly collaborative effort. Premiers from across the country all agree that we need to support our essential workers. And I thank the Premiers for the continued Team Canada approach. We're relying on these workers now more than ever, and we will be there to support them. It will be up to each province and territory to determine who exactly qualifies for this wage in increase. But the bottom line is this. If you're risking your health to keep this country moving and you're making minimum wage, you deserve a raise. I want to close by noting that today, Buddhists in Canada and around the world will mark Vesak, their most important festival. While this year's celebrations will be a bit different, the Buddha's message of peace, selfless service, and compassion to those in need is more important than ever. I want to wish a happy and peaceful Vesak to all those celebrating. I'm now happy to take people's questions. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. On va commencer à faire des questions par le téléphone aujourd'hui. Opérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. Première question, Catherine Lévesque, la presse canadienne. À vous. Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau. Uh, comment expliquez-vous ça? Monsieur Trudeau, how to explain it took so long? To deal, to get to that deal uh, with the balance for the premiums for our, our guardian angels, and did you get to um, a, a number of four or five dollar, uh, five uh, five dollars per hour hike? Uh, we know that provinces are facing different situations uh, from sea to sea, and again, so I think we have different approaches uh, regarding their essential workers. So, in the federal level, we wanted to help provinces with three quarters of the funding that that they will have in order to support their essential workers. Uh, the federal level, we're talking about four billion dollars. Uh, investment for essential workers across the country, but the provinces themselves will decide specifically how and to who those funds will be offered. So there won't be any uniform premium offered across Canada, so if I understand you well. Uh, also, your head uh, scientist uh, um, expert has gone against uh, the uh, the plan of Quebec, do you, are you of the same advice and has Quebec uh, dropped the ball on this? We acknowledge that we need to do much more uh, tracking tests in the coming months if we want to reopen the economy, if we want to continue to keep Canadians safe. All provinces and territories must do more. We have seen improvements, important improvements, even in the last few days, including in Quebec. And at the federal level, we will continue to work with all the provinces in order to improve tracking tests. And uh, we need to do more. And we will continue to be there to help provinces and territories to do more. Thank you. Okay, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Ryan Tillopy, National Post. Ryan Open. Yeah, good morning, Prime Minister. I'm wondering if you can give us an idea of what this pro this program will cost the federal government overall. Um, and given that you seem to be leaving this up to the provinces, like what sort of guidelines have you given them about how to spend those federal dollars? We see across the country uh, people working on the front lines in essential services, in our seniors' care systems, in our uh, long-term uh, long-term care, in our health care systems, and elsewhere. Uh, who are making uh, very low wages uh, while doing extraordinarily important work. That's why uh, we announced a number of uh, days ago that we wanted to move forward with a top-up to be delivered by the provinces uh, to those workers who uh, needed that extra support. Uh, we put forward around $4 billion uh, from the federal government uh, to be matched uh, 
three quarters uh, from the federal government, mm -hmm. one quarter from the provincial government on helping those workers right across the country. But because of the variance across the country, both of the COVID-19 situation and of a delivery of essential services, including health care, uh, we uh, felt that it was best the provinces move forward in choosing exactly how they can best help the workers who are doing such important work right across the country. This is another great example of how the federal government and the provinces and territories have been able to come together, collaborate, work together to support Canadians through this extremely difficult time. On follow up, Ryan? Yeah, uh, what about um, non medical workers, I guess, people who work in grocery stores, delivery drivers, some of those workers, like you say, are, are working minimum wage, are they going to be eligible for this top up? As I said, those are determinations to be made by the provinces. I know a number of provinces had already put out lists of uh, workers that they consider to be essential, and many of them are drawing from uh, those lists in terms of uh, who gets the top up. We have confidence that the provinces uh, will determine exactly how best to help Canadians in this time. The federal government wanted to be there, and we know uh, that offering this money to workers right across the country will make a big difference. Difference, and we trust the provinces to make sure uh, that people who need it gets this help. Thank you. Operator, prochaine question. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Emily Bergeron, Agence QMI. À vous. Oui, bonjour, M. Trudeau. Uh, back, concernant cet annonce uh, sur. Uh, Regarding this announcement on the, the uh, modification of the wages, or the wage modification, it was announced for a long time and you have no numbers around this so how much it will get to in terms of the costs and the federal government uh, contribution for quebec precisely will there be a compensation plan due to the fact that they already have a, their own program uh, on this we sign deals uh, and we're about to sign deals with all the provinces and territories we know it's something on which the federal government and the provinces can and must work together at the federal level we talk about four billion dollars as an investment in workers across the country and we count um, we we want to support three quarters of the programs that provinces will bring forth. With Quebec, we have concluded a deal, and I know that uh, it's well received that the federal government will be there to help Quebec in the job that they're doing. Concerning the military's uh, troops in the CHSL, you know it was a problem in terms of uh, the fact that there's medical personnel coming and going from one place to another, but in terms of the military, can you reassure people that once they are affected to one place, they will stay there? I can, I can, uh, I, I have no information specifically to, to share, but I can say that militaries take all the precautions to make sure, and well, first their own security when they do their job, but also, of course, uh, the safety of all those that they're, they're serving, and that's why uh, the military are affected to the precise CHSLDs, and we want, really want to help and not risking to spread even more COVID-19 across. Thank you, merci. Next question, Theresa Wright, the Canadian Press. Line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, earlier this week, the Chinese embassy tweeted that the N95 masks, which were rejected by Canada last month, were the result of a contractual issue that has now been resolved. Your deputy prime minister and health minister said that they would look into it, but have yet to respond to explain what happened. Was there a contract problem that led to one million masks from China being rejected? What was the issue and has it been resolved? We have, over the past weeks, uh, received uh, uh, millions upon millions of items of PPE from around the world, including from China. Uh, over uh, uh, over the course of these, uh, this time, there have been uh, a, a small number that have been uh, uh, 
not uh, to the levels that uh, Canadians expected. Uh, we are continuing to uh, follow up and work on it to make sure that the equipment that we deliver to our frontline workers, to our healthcare workers across this country, uh, is uh, at Canadian standards. Uh, we will be receiving uh, flights of PPE from uh, from China and other places almost daily uh, over the coming uh, coming weeks. Uh, we know that we are uh, needing to ensure enough high quality equipment for uh, Canadians right across the country and we're continuing to do just that. It's been weeks now that uh, we have received uh, about 20 flights with the medical equipment from China, mainly, but also from elsewhere in the world. We know that with the millions and millions of equipment articles we got and items we got, there's a small percentage that wasn't on par uh, in terms of our expectations as Canadians that, and what we could give out to our frontline workers. So we are putting them aside. We are working in order to avoid uh, to get more uh, that are not on par of our standards. But we're, we're trusting that as we are getting more flights with the equipment every day in order to, uh, for the week coming, that we will have enough equipment, uh, quality equipment for Canadians. Thank you. Uh, people working in grocery stores and on farms and in long-term care facilities have often come from marginalized populations, and now they're considered essential workers. Are we placing too high a burden on marginalized people in this pandemic? I think one of the things that we're seeing through this pandemic is uh, that there are people who are tremendously economically vulnerable and vulnerable in other ways in our society uh, who are extremely important to the functioning of our society. Uh, as we've made it through this pandemic so far, we've been focusing on supporting these most vulnerable people and this top up for essential workers delivered by the provinces uh, it is another piece of support for people who need it in order to get through this time uh, as best we can as a country. We know, however, that once we get through this in the months and years to come, we're also going to have to have reflections about uh, how we manage and how we uh, maintain our long-term care facilities, uh, how we support essential workers who are very low paid, uh, how we move forward as a society to make sure uh, that uh, our vulnerable are properly uh, taken care of and properly rewarded for the important work they do. Je pense que euh, nous allons tous réfléchir. Je pense que nous allons tous être réfléchis dans les mois et les années à venir sur comment nous pouvons assurer que ceux qui font du essentiel travail sont bien payés. Ils ne sont pas eux-mêmes extrêmement vulnérables économiquement. Ce sont des pensées certainement qu'il faut avoir dans le moyen et long terme. Dans le moyen terme, nous soutenons tout ce que nous pouvons, tout ce que nous avons besoin avec des différentes mesures including the Canadian emergency uh, benefit, but also with the, what we're announcing today, um, uh, an additional amount for essential workers delivered by promises. We must get through this moment, but of course, so we will have many thoughts to have as a society on how we can improve Canada for all of us. Good morning, Prime Minister. Captain Gallagher, CTV News. Um, Cargill meatpacking in High River, Alberta. The workers have gone back. Many are still very concerned about the safety of their work conditions, but also outside of the factory in their communities. Many are experiencing racism and discrimination because they work at the plant. Many of them, of course, are new Canadians. Um, well, you have said that worker safety really falls under provincial jurisdiction, but at what point? Does the federal government have to step in to ensure worker safety at Cargill and other food processing facilities across the country? One of the things that this um, crisis has shown us is uh, various points of vulnerability, both in our supply chains, but also uh, in terms of uh, people who work in jobs that we find extremely important right across the country uh, for feeding Canadians, for uh, allowing our economy to run. There are obviously going to be many reflections we're going to have to have as a society in the coming months and years on how we make sure that the country is fair and the country is uh, supportive and protecting everyone in the important work that they do. 
Uh, in the meantime, we will continue to work with the provinces on assuring both uh, continued uh, flow of uh, food supply chains, uh, but also ensuring that there is uh, proper support for the people who work in these industries and in, these in this uh, processing and uh, in agriculture. Uh, that was part of what our announcement yesterday, which was a uh, first and initial uh, installment, our first investment in uh, supporting agricultural workers and producers to be able to be safe while they do such important work for Canadians. Uh, we're talking about uh like the largest outbreak in North America here. So how do you evaluate the provincial um, regulators here? You know, has the province done enough in your view to keep those workers safe? I think there are a lot of questions being asked uh, of uh, how various provinces has ha handled different aspects of this pandemic. I will be uh, talking with the premiers tonight to uh, offer again in, in so many different ways how the federal government can help. What we just announced today as a top up for essential workers is a great example of the federal government and the provincial governments working together on protecting Canadians. Uh, obviously, there are always things to learn, always things that we need to do better. And as the provinces uh, look to step up and do, uh, do more and do differently and do better, uh, the federal government will be there to support them. Bonjour, M. Snow, Mathieu Goyer de Radio-Canada. Je reviens sur l'annonce du jour, le supplément que vous annoncez. Est-ce que c'est pas la preuve, un aveu, que la PCU était trop généreuse et qu'elle retenait des travailleurs essentiels à la maison? On va voir euh, les chiffres sortir demain euh, par rapport euh, aux pertes d'emploi au mois d'avril dans ce pays. Il y a des millions de job losses demain. Et donc, les millions de Canadiens ont perdu leur paycheck, ont perdu leurs jobs. Ils n'ont pas la capacité et ne pourraient pas avoir la capacité de acheter des groceries pour leur famille ou de payer leurs rentes. Mais l'emergence de bénéfice était là pour les Canadiens de Canadiens pour les soutenir in days uh, where we must all stay home. And it's an essential measure. And it's, it's, it's showing how Canadians are there one for another in the times of difficulty at the same time that we acknowledge that the workers are doing essential work for society. And they should have a bonification of their, their wages. And that's why we're so happy to have worked with provinces in order to deliver help to those workers. I want to go back on testing. Uh, after uh, what was raised by Madame de Mer, is it a pan-Canadian uniform strategy for tracking and testing to make sure that all the provinces have the right tools to follow the evolution of the pandemic as they are opening up their economy? Provinces are facing very different situations from one place to another across the country, and so a program, a federal program that would apply the same everywhere, wouldn't be the right solution. And we're there to support provinces, to help provinces with resources and uh, with material to establish better plans in order to better uh, advance or good to proceed with tests in order to reopen the economy while uh, keeping. Uh, their workers healthy and safe and will continue to work and there's always place to improve in every province and we'll be there to support them and to work with them in uh, this uh, unprecedented situation. Of GCBC. Uh, as a lot of uh, governments are looking towards uh, recovery from this, the economic recovery here in Canada, how will you be able to uh, help the Canadian economy get back on its feet from this, reduce spending, and yet also respect some of the promises that you made in the elections and big ticket items like pharma care and infrastructure spending? Obviously, uh, this situation has become the new priority that we have to deal with. It is a, an economic impact, the likes of which hasn't been seen in over 70 years on Canadians from coast to coast to coast, on families, on sectors, on businesses. Uh, and the measures we have put forward that are historic uh, and without precedent in terms of supporting families and supporting workers and supporting communities and supporting small businesses, uh, these are the things that are going to help us get through. And our priority right now is helping people uh, hold on while we have to uh, stay isolated because of COVID-19 and then uh, start uh, restarting carefully the economy in a gradual and progressive way with the right measures in place. 
uh, once we get through this, there will be plenty of time to talk about what the longer term looks like, what the future of Canada looks like, what is needed uh, for various sectors, for various Canadians. We've seen a whole bunch of new needs popped up that uh, we had not paid much attention to over the past years, uh, like the plight of most vulnerable workers. Uh, I mean, we had, as a government, uh, invested massively in reducing poverty over the past five years. We've seen uh, over uh, a million people lifted out of poverty, but uh, there's obviously much more to do, and we're going to continue to focus on that. I think there is going to be time to talk about long-term plans uh, as we get through this. Uh, right now, our focus is on getting Canadians through this. Right, but other governments are also focused on recovery and what they will do as part of that recovery. The UK, for example, as climate advisors are saying that all recovery will have a green focus. Uh, how they, they have a net zero by 2050 commitment just as your government does. So how will the recovery uh, take into account your climate change promises in the last election? I think one of the, the things that we're very much thinking about is how do we build back better? How do we uh, look at what this pandemic has challenged us with, what it has highlighted around uh, needs or gaps in Canada, and how do we uh, look to rebuild and recover uh, in a way that advances us in the right direction? Obviously, uh, less pollution, uh, greener outcomes are going to be a part of it, uh, more digital, uh, more connected is going to be a part of it, better supports for vulnerable Canadians and more equality across this country needs to be part of it as well. These are principles that we're looking at right now and reflecting on how we go forward uh, and we're going to continue to. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. Yesterday, Green Party parliamentary leader Elizabeth May said the oil sector in Canada is basically dead. And the bloc leader went on to say putting more money into that business is a very bad idea. I'm just wondering if you would share this assessment and will your government give more money to this industry given the opposition and given how low oil prices are and is expected to continue for the unseeable future? I don't share that assessment. I know that if we are to move forward in transforming uh, our economy uh, towards lower emissions and uh, cleaner processes, uh, workers uh, and uh, innovators in Alberta and across the country in the energy sector are going to be an essential part of that transformation. As we move forward uh, towards a different energy mix, as we move forward to lower uh, fossil fuel emissions, uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we need the innovation, the hard work, uh, and the, uh, uh, the vision and the creativity of uh, people working right now in the energy sector. We need to support Albertans uh, and, uh, and other uh, people working in the energy sector uh, through this incredible difficult time as families, as workers, as communities, not just because that's what we do as Canadians, but because we need their capacity uh, to innovate and figure out how we're going to move forward towards uh, our greater, greener goals. We can't do it without them, and that's why we're going to keep supporting them in the right ways. Okay. Uh, that up. Uh, I don't agree with, uh, uh, with this uh, assessment. Uh, we know that the only way that we will go forth as a country is with uh, the energy sector as partners and to create solutions for the long term uh, to reduce emissions, to innovate in the creation of new technology. We need innovative minds and workers in our energy sectors. We cannot reach those targets without having partners in the energy sector working with us in order to find those solutions in order to transform our energy sector. We need those families, we need those workers, we need those communities in Alberta and elsewhere to be part of the solution and for this we must support them. We will support them not only because that's what we do as Canadians to be there one for another, but we will support them because they are allies, essential allies in the transformation of our economy to a, a better future for all of us. You previously indicated that you would look at other nations, for example, France and Australia, and what they are doing when it comes to tech giants like Google and Facebook being forced to share ad revenue with Canadian news content providers. Given how many news content providers are struggling, especially in small towns, 
and in some cases closing and how vital those are to those small towns. Um, you said you would address the matter. I'm just wondering, are you prepared to do so now, especially at such a vital time for truth and news? It is extremely important that we support uh, our news uh, sector because Canadians need uh, the information to keep them safe, uh, to plan for their futures, uh, to lean on each other. We need the media now during a crisis more than we ever have. And that's why, as a government that has put forward significant measures to support uh, news media, uh, we're going to continue to work to do just that. I can assure you that Minister Gibbo uh, is working very hard, very closely uh, with uh, allies around the world to see what they're doing and uh, with the sector here in Canada to ensure that Canadians get top quality information, that uh, decision makers and politicians continue to be held to account uh, and that uh, we continue uh, to make decisions based on facts and a shared understanding of the reality we're facing. The work that the media does is essential. We will continue to support it. The media and the reason they focus on the media and information networks are more important now, more than ever. We know that.